see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And I'm very pleased today to have uh, Johan Galtung joining me here. Uh, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Edwin. Johan Galtung here. Close right. to Geneva. In Geneva, close to Geneva. And well, I wanted to give a little intro uh, about yourself, a little background. And you're the uh, father of uh, peace studies and principal founder of the discipline of peace and conflict studies. And for example, I'm here at UC, near UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and they have a peace and conflict studies program. So you were one of the early founders of these types of uh, programs. And then you've also published over 100 books, including The Fall of the U.S. Empire and Then What? Uh, and you've uh, mediated over 150 conflicts between states and nations. And uh, you're the co-founder of uh, Transcend International, which is an organization for uh, trans conflict transformation by peaceful means. And it's located at transcend.org. And uh, I see here that the mission is to bring about a more peaceful world by using action, education, training, dissemination, and research to transform conflicts nonviolently with empathy and creativity for acceptable and sustainable outcomes. So uh, is there more you'd like to add by way of introduction? I think you have quoted our mantras very well. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the way we say it. You see... If you could add to conflict transformation, maybe um, trauma, reconciliation, trauma reconciliation. That's the violent conflict in the past that has been deposited in the minds of peoples, persons and peoples. And you could add equity, building cooperation, and maybe harmony, empathy. So conflict resolution Trauma conciliation, building equity, building harmony. Uh, maybe the four components of positive peace, as I see it. Mm. Well, there's a uh, a quote that I by you that I use all the time, and it's uh, the quote is uh, by peace we mean the capacity to transform conflicts with empathy, without violence, and creativity, a never-ending process. And um, for me, that quote is almost like uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared. You know, it's kind of like this basic kind of well, formula. It is a way. It is a way of summarizing it. So tell me how able you are to transform conflicts, and I'll tell you how much peace there is inside you. But you see, a key word here is able, ability, capability, skill, knowledge, training. It doesn't just come like that automatically. For instance, in Norway now, we have a big project called Sabona, which is a Suli word, not a Norwegian word. And it means I take you in, you're the part of me, like Ubuntu, you know. I exist because you exist and vice versa. And what they are trying to do now is to work on kindergarten, small children, two years old, three years old. And when they do something, let us call it wrong, like, for instance, beating another child, then the kindergarten teachers now know something they should do. They should point out that in this kindergarten we don't beat each other. But why did you do it? In other words, always taking the um, evildoer, the perpetrator, seriously, inviting him or her in. Why did you do it? And then comes often surprising answers. For instance, uh, he has been having that teddy bear too long. It's my time now. Okay, that's a fair answer. Whereupon the kindergarten teacher can say, but you know, you could also ask. You don't have to beat. You could ask. Okay, the idea of the question. And then the kindergarten teacher has to do one little thing. She has to supply the verbal formula. Like, for instance, saying, don't you think it is my turn now? Because you cannot assume that children automatically know that formula. And just the same applies to adults. You have to know how to ask. 
For instance, it seems to me quite obvious that the United States is not very good at asking Taliban what would be a good solution. I don't trust the reporting they get about their so-called dialogue with Taliban since I have my own contact with Taliban and have asked such questions very often. So it, sometimes the training is simply in verbal skills. So it's uh, well. I was going to. You're you're saying uh, how we can kind of foster empathy, and it's like we can kind kind of uh, teach like skills for fostering empathy. Precisely. And then we can actually start in the schools. We could start uh, at the earliest grades to start teaching these empathy building skills. You know, to come back to the teddy bear again, just to point out that you like to keep the teddy bear in your arms, but maybe he also likes it. He is very similar to you in that regard. But that doesn't mean that you own the teddy bear or he owns the teddy bear. I'll tell you to whom the teddy bear belongs. It belongs to the kindergarten. But that doesn't mean that you cannot share it. You can have it between you, look at it, pat it. You can have it in your arms and he in your in his, but it has to be shared and you have to wait for your turn. But you have a right to your turn. You know, simple rules, very simple rules. And then you train them in that, and it's surprising how quickly they learn it. But the basic key is not just to scold and say, we don't beat in this kindergarten, and then, you know, look stern, but be inviting. Why did you do it? So that opens for quite a lot. And if you want the general formula, we try to explore what parties in a conflict have as a goal and what they think is a good means to obtain that goal. So in the teddy bear example, the goal to keep the bear in his or her arms is perfectly okay, but the means starting beating is not okay. In other words, you can say we are trying to build the idea of legitimate goals and adequate means. You can say that if you look at U.S. in Afghanistan, let us say that the U.S. really believed that 9-11 came from Afghanistan, which I don't believe for a second, but anyhow, let us say they believe that. And the question is, what's the adequate means to see to it that there is no repeat? Well, the adequate means may not be to kill very, very, very many people. There's a dispute about how many. Because in that case, revenge may come up as an idea, and that may go one generation, two generations at least. In other words, let us say some 50, 60 years of revengeful activity. So the means seem to be inadequate, to put it mildly. But that doesn't mean that the goal not to be attacked from another country is illegitimate. That's okay. So, if we now start at the age of two or three with that kind of thing, again, I repeat, the children understand it almost immediately. Adults have problems. And then we try to investigate why do adults have so many problems? And one formula is that adults want to be right, to have right. And that's why they love courts. Because you know, a court can issue a certificate saying you were right, he was not. And then you can put a sort of you know, poster on you say, saying, I was right, you not. Now, that is not a good approach in a marriage on the rocks. Or between two neighbors quarreling about a tree that uh, casts a shadow on the coffee table in one of the gardens or things of that type. Um, to be right maybe not such a good approach. Maybe better to see that uh, maybe both parties are right in something. And then try to find out where is the legitimacy in the other guy and where is my legitimacy and then try to bridge together. Well, that's a little bit like righteousness seems to be a block to empathy. Righteousness and self-righteousness becomes this block to creating connection between people. That's exactly the word. And righteousness seems to come with age, 
<laughs> that, that would be the Piaget approach, the Jean Piaget, this uh, genius Swiss psychologist who was looking at the genesis of concepts. And um, very basic is the concept of reciprocity, whereas autism comes first. Whatever happens to me has nothing to do with me. It's not the result of what I have done. It simply happens from good sources or bad sources. A mother's breast is good, and if I can't get it, I have discovered a method, and that's crying. Now, reciprocity, I expect and want something good. Maybe one approach would be that I do something good. That comes later. And it seems to come with girls earlier than boys. Now, the moment you have reciprocity as a concept, the idea of justice comes up. Namely, whether I have done my part and now I have a right to expect the other part to do something. That's okay, but the righteousness goes one step further. That's a kind of basic attitude that I'm always right and you're always wrong. Or at least you have more than 90% of the wrong on your side. So the question is, how can we build on reciprocity? And one formula which uh, I think is good, cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Reciprocity, mutual and equal benefit. Now, equal doesn't have to be mathematical, but not flagrantly unequal, to put it that way. So there we are far into positive peace. And again, the experiments that we have made in a tiny little town in eastern Norway, close to the Swedish border, nothing to do with location at all, but it's a very ordinary place called Kongsvinger. The experience we have made in kindergarten and elementary school are very encouraging when it comes to children. Well, what I'm really, what I'm looking at is the value of empathy and, you know, I have started this center for building a culture of empathy. So it's really about how do we transform society to raise empathy to be like a primary social value. And uh, it seems, and that's what I enjoy so much about your, um, find so useful about that quote that you mentioned, is there's a whole peace movement and it seems that the peace movement uh, does not talk a lot about empathy. And it's like in, in that quote that you have, you've kind of distilled it and really shown that peace is kind of really based on this empathic connection between people. Well, that's exactly the point. And you know, there is a very simple method. And the method is to ask people. So the way that I try as a mediator, to get at empathy, and an empathy that may develop into sympathy too. It's simply to ask a person, a party to a conflict, what does the Afghanistan look like where you would like to live? What does a marriage look like which you would like to be a party to? What does a society look like where you feel that your gender is being treated justly? And things of that kind. Now, you spin on that question. In the beginning, the answer may be a little bit sort of stereotyped, political. But after some time, going, probing more deeply, you'll get to know the person. And you'll get to know what the whole issue looks like from that party's point of view. So let me take Taliban as an example. So I'm sitting somewhere in the world with Taliban. Could be in Afghanistan, could be outside and asking what does the Afghanistan look like that you would like to live in. They answer point one, Muslim, Islamic. And Islamic does not mean that it isn't Christian and Jewish. As a matter of fact, the religions of the book we feel very close to. But it's not secular. And what the West is doing to us now is all kinds of secular so-called development assistance to win the minds and hearts. These are not blessed by Allah. They don't come to us as they should come, as a gift from the Almighty One, inside the setting that we respect. Point two, 
Ours is a country of 25,000 villages, very independent. They may be poor, very poor, dirt poor, but they are themselves. And we hate Kabul. All the foreigners who want to somehow dominate us always have the illusion that we are one unified country because it looks like that way on the map. There is a border and the country has one color, whatever that color is. Now, 25,000 villages and eight nations or something like that. In other words, the only way to come to grips with Afghanistan is to respect the autonomy of those parts. And here, Edwin, when I heard this the first time, I was always ask, I'm always asking myself what does this remind me of? It reminds me of Switzerland. Four nations, 2,300 villages, local communities. And they have built their own democracy on that basis. Four languages have the equal, equal rights and the famous local democracy and direct voting takes place in those 2,300. So maybe Switzerland could be a model. And point three, the Taliban say, we are sick and tired of being invaded because you are playing some kind of chess game. And Afghanistan is one of the pawns, is that chess game. Yeah. So, so are you saying it's uh, basically if we look at it through the lens of empathy, it's actually going to listen to the Taliban to say what's where are what's going on for you? What is it that you're what are your values and actually hearing those and actually empathizing with them instead of saying you need to do this, you need to do that. It's like, where are exactly. you at? Uh -huh. That's exactly it. I try to get to know them by knowing what they want. And that doesn't mean that I don't respect the State Department person who says, we want an Afghanistan from which no attack can come, hitting us or anybody else. So I then look at my little legitimacy barometer. Sounds to me perfectly legitimate. The question is, how do you obtain it? So here you have then goals, and the question is to transcend, to bridge those goals, to solve the conflict. Now, uh, we did that mediation exercise in Afghanistan the first time in February 2001. The 9-11 was by definition in September, and 1007, the attack on Afghanistan, was in October that year. In that mediation, which had to be in Peshawar, but there were Taliban present in Pakistan, but there were Taliban present in the room. We were told by a very prominent Afghan politician, who also was a refugee in Peshawar, across the border to Pakistan, that he had been told that the U.S. wanted to attack in October. Now, this was far, much ahead of September. In other words, it sounded like the war against Afghanistan had already been prepared. And that makes you ask, what were the goals? Well, maybe the goal was a base, as this prominent politician said, and a pipeline from the Caspian to the Indian Ocean. As you know, both of these were established very early in the game. I don't think I would put that down as legitimate goals. Mm -hmm. No. Attacked, I would call a legitimate goal. So, how do I decide what's legitimate, what's not legitimate? I would use international law. I would use human rights. I would use basic needs. And the way that the US then proceeded, unfortunately, broke all three. So, that makes for an understanding of what the US wanted, but not sympathy. In the Taliban case, understanding what the Taliban wanted, but not unlimited sympathy. Mm -hmm. That's have been very brutal, very violent. So very violent, mm -hmm. even if there is an element of uh, suicide in it, that doesn't make them less violent. So it's a, a real lack of empathy in, in that relationship. and. Uh, you know, what, one thing I, I'm looking at... Understanding, you know, we're doing empathy without having ne ne either sympathy nor antipathy. Mm -hmm. you, by empathy, I simply mean that you understand them so well that you are in their shoes 
and you can see the things the way they see it. So um, I find, you know, a typical definition of empathy is the metaphor, like you just said, of looking through someone else's eyes or in standing through their sh in their shoes. Uh, do you have, and for me, you know, I have a personal metaphor, which is empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense that a cornucopia is all this rich, it kind of opens this world to of connection and sharing other people's uh, feelings and emotions and kind of is a richness in the relationship. Uh, if you had a metaphor of empathy, what would empathy be like to you personally? I am very much inspired by what actors do when they are training for a role to have to be that person. Now, actors can, of course, switch from one person to the other, depending on whom they are acting. And I, as a mediator, can do the same. And that's where the cornucopia comes in. <laughs> and exactly your metaphor. So, you see, Collingwood, I think, has said about historians that they have to be inside the skin and the mind of the person they are writing about. I think there's much to do. So, empathy. So em this, of course, if you have done this, um, I could say the most difficult for the first 100 times. After that, you start learning it. So, empathy is like actors putting themselves into the role of someone else, into the right. act and to taking the on. Point, mm -hmm. To the point of being that person. Mm. At least for that evening, one and a half hours. Yeah, a really good actor really embodies the whole emotional feel of, of the other person. Surely. And I think that's what you see as a spectator being in the theater. What you see and what you sense is how genuine the identification is. But if you're all the time projecting yourself and your own goals and you see the other party are standing in your way, then you are lost. You will never develop empathy. How did you first... And I think that worries me so much about the U.S. approach to foreign affairs is that yeah. from a very early point on, they somehow define and decide that these are people we cannot talk with. And that is where the word fundamentalist, extremist, and terrorist enters. And the goal of a terrorist is only to spread terror. And the fundamentalist, you cannot touch him, you cannot move him, dialogue is useless. Well, I've never found people like that. Mm -hmm. I found that people are people. And let me tell you one thing. You see, people often ask me, but are they answering honestly? I'll tell you one thing. If you ask somebody, terrorist, fundamentalist, extremist, the Middle East, what's the Middle East you would like to live in? The problem is not whether he will answer. The problem is to stop it. He will talk for hours. And why is that? Because nobody has bothered to ask him. Mm -hmm. Nobody has bothered to ask him. And you listen, you take it seriously, and you will listen to quite a lot of strange things, but suddenly what starts coming makes more and more sense, and you can see his inner logic. In it. I can only say that when I do that, I haven't heard anybody wanting to push Israelis into the sea. I have heard deep skepticism, basic critique of Zionism, but not of the concept of a state in Israel with Jewish characteristics. You can say that they have constructed a Zionism, an ever expansionist Zionism, maybe from Nile to the Euphrates, or whatever they, let us say, uh, attribute to Zionists. They have an image. Uh, Zionists in Israel may have other images, and it's my task to try to sort that out. But when it comes, doesn't necessarily sound unreasonable when you look at, let's say, the people who are suffering through Israeli expansion. From so it's point. really, even in, in uh, global politics, it's that being the actor and putting that the countries, the people, need we need to put each other in each other's... Uh, in each other's role, really take it on like acting. So maybe teaching acting, you know, might be a good way to uh, foster empathy in the schools, even. Precisely, and you're trying politics and mediation to convey what the other says, 
to the person unwilling to even consider the other as a human being. But see them all as an automaton driven, for instance, by the desire to spread terror. Mm -hmm. So it's like the you're saying that the Americans, oh sorry, the Americans aren't uh, putting themselves in the shoes of, of uh, people that, that are called terrorists and really trying to see what's What's kind of uh, where kind of see the world from their perspective and what their experiences are that there is just like cutting them off, saying, no, we're not going to look. And that's it. And yeah. vice versa. And vice versa. Oh, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, Taliban, that whom I know, are quite willing to concede that the United States has a legitimate goal not to be attacked. And they've heard Taliban saying they can imagine U.S. bases staying in the country after the withdrawal in 2014. Can you imagine that? Mm. Exactly because they feel in their bodies that they have a concern. And they think they will be able to persuade those people in those bases after a relatively short while that they can also pack up and go home. It's unnecessary. But uh, I think they could imagine that. So it, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I did want to kind of explore the nature of empathy a little bit with you, too. And I was wondering, how did you first see the uh, power of empathy? Do you have like a, an anecdote, a story of where you first said, oh, this is empathy. This is really important. How did I'll that? You. Yeah, I have a story. I have a story. I have actually my first mediation experience. It was a little bit by chance. It was of all places in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was young assistant professor at the um, Department of Sociology at Columbia University and decided to do a study of the desegregation conflict in Charlottesville, Virginia. So then we went, I with my PhD candidates in a rusty car. And one of the first things that I wanted to do was to find out more about how white segregationists were thinking. So somebody made me visit a lady, an FFV, First Families of Virginia, very gentle looking, very cultured, and in a very, very opulent, nice house, beautifully furnished and everything. And she was quite willing to explain to me why she was very, very, very much against desegregation. So she looked at me and said, um, as you know, Negroes, as she said, are black. You know why? Because their blood is black. You know why their blood is black? It's because they have syphilis microbes in the blood, and syphilis microbes are black. And all you have to do is with a little pin to get a drop of blood, and you will see it is black. Now, I was not quite trained for that. Let me put it this way, but I had learned that what you should say is just to be generally sort of uh, responsive and say, would you care to elaborate that a little bit more? Well, I said that. And she said, in addition to that, they hate us. In addition to that, they're communists. All of them are communists. They don't understand American society at all. And in addition to that, they're ugly. Now, young Professor Galter, do right if you have a daughter to have a son-in-law with syphilis microbes in the blood, who is filled with hate, is a communist, and in addition is ugly. So I said, it sounds to me not like a very good prospect. Whereupon she nodded and she pointed out of the window and said, do you see those hills? Oh, those were the Shenandoah Mountains. Are they upside down or downside up? And I reported that they were, you know, with the upside up and the downside down. So she answered to me, just like that, it has to be in society too. Meaning whites on top, blacks at the bottom. Okay, I felt I had learned something. So what conclusion did I draw from that? Well, I drew the conclusion that she probably meant it. And when we later on came to the crunch and I had been asked to mediate, 
my conclusion was when some of the die-hard segregationists wanted a private school for themselves and their children, my conclusion was, let them have it. It won't last long. Because after a short while, they will see in the integrated school that nothing bad happens. Everything will just work out. And I did a second thing, Edwin. I had long interviews with the blacks. Just simply saying, what does the Charlottesville look like where you would like to live? And out came the American dream. Equal opportunity for us blacks, equal opportunity in school, equal opportunity for jobs, and ultimately a little house with a little garden and a garage with a cottage. In short, the American dream. I remember myself sometimes feeling, couldn't there be something a little bit more, let's call it radical, than that? No, no, just the American dream. So I reported the American dream. And I also reported the safety valve aspect. Now, that private segregation is good, lasted one year or two, whereupon they relaxed. But you can say that I, not that I had the slightest sympathy with her views, but I felt in my bones that she was genuine, in the sense it was not a show she was putting on. And I was then thinking, if you feel like that, you probably need very substantial proof that this is wrong. And that substantial proof cannot be by preaching. It has to be empirical. So, hence my two conclusions. Mm -hmm. My first mediation experience, Edwin. And, um, I have been critiqued for the private school, and the debate in the U.S. is very well known. And I, I respect it. And yet there was the safety value aspect. And the empathy part of that was that you were willing to listen to both sides. Is that where you're seeing the empathy is that you didn't just cut them off, but you really were there and present with the both sides. dialogue with both sides, sitting hours and hours, listening, listening, precisely. The American dream on one side and the fears, the anxieties, the deep stereotypes and prejudices, hatred. And you know, Edwin, one thing that I have encountered again and again and again, when you have a top-down society, one group at the top and one group at the bottom, there is an existential fear at the top, and it can be expressed in one sentence. When they come up, they will treat us the same way as we treated them. Mm. And I know exactly how they had treated the blacks. It's not that they didn't know it, they were just afraid. So when I am mediating now, learning from that experience, that's a basic one. This is a basic point in the conflict resolution. Trying to convince that that will not happen. Trying to teach the people at the top that an egalitarian society will be better for all projects. You will find a much broader horizon for your acquaintances, your friends, your colleagues, maybe even your marriage partners for that matter. Much, much richer society. And for those at the bottom, you will be able to accommodate because you know much better about their style of life than they know about yours. Well, from, from that first experience to, you know, your organization Transcend International, where you're very explicitly using the word empathy and and, uh, you know, it's within your mission statement and a couple of, of uh, points. How did that uh, transition happen where you started getting the vocabulary for it and making it so uh, kind of explicitly central to, to your work? Empathy is explicitly central, but it's not the only central concept. Well, I encountered the same thing again and again. You see, what I did was that I had dialogues with the people who were not approachable, the people with whom you shouldn't talk. And of course, I got some negative reactions out of that, that's natural, from those who put up barriers. But I found the same patterns again and again. The lack of understanding of the other side. 
So, let us say that you talk with people close to Al-Qaeda. And um, to me, Al-Qaeda is a movement more than an organization. And to construct an Al-Qaeda with Osama bin Laden on top, I think it's pure nonsense. He was a commentator. He was enthusiastic about many things. But a leader of a vast, big, pyramidal international network, he was not. But let's leave that point aside. You do that, you ask what you want. What does the world look like where you would like to live? The answer I get almost invariably is a world with respect for Islam. Respect for Islam. Not trampling on Islam, but respecting it. And respecting it means that there are a couple of small things you have to know about Islam. For instance, that we are extremely positive, we Muslims, to the religions of the book. Judaism and Christianity and we so much would hope that we that this could be reciprocated you can say that Islam sees itself as in a sense building on the two and carrying it further now respect for Islam I think is entirely possible the question is what does it mean these days after a certain YouTube movie video, we are experiencing exactly the opposite. That was the most unfortunate happening. And of course, you find now demonstrations all over in the Muslim world, which will probably spread much further than right now. Today we have it maybe in seven, eight countries, tomorrow maybe in 16 or whatever. Uh, that's what's to be expected. So this empathy with Islam is important. I am not quite sure that the Muslims are so good at bringing it about. Not quite sure about that. Uh, they demand uh, absence of prejudice, no discrimination. They are entitled to that according to human rights, conventions, declarations and so on. But maybe they could um, spread images of what Islam stands for better. In my understanding, I'm not a Muslim, not a Christian. In my understanding, Islam stands for togetherness and sharing. Togetherness is exemplified by how close they are together when they pray. Sharing by the zakat, by seeing to it that everybody in the 20 houses around their own have enough to eat before you yourself sit down eating. Now, they're human beings, not everybody practices it equally well, but these are, I would say, admirable things. And there are things there that we might be interested in, we in the Christian secular West. In other words, mutual learning. So when they ask Muslims, what can you learn from the West? I get a very interesting answer. There are Christianities and Christianities. How about Islam? is too, let us say, um, monochromatic. We would like more variety, more diversity in it. And sometimes this variety, particularly in Protestant Christianity, is admirable and attractive. Now, you have already a basis for a good dialogue. And that good dialogue again has empathy, trying to understand the other party, what is the space within which he is moving. And that could move then towards sympathy. And here comes uh, the concept of harmony, Edwin, which goes a little bit further than um, sympathy, by than empathy. I took it from Taoism, and it's a very beautiful formulation. To <coughs> suffer the sufferings of others, and to enjoy the joy of others. In other words, some kind of resonance. The empathy has come to the point that the two have become one, or close to. I find that not a bad formula for a good marriage. A good marriage is based on exactly suffering the sufferings of your spouse, and enjoy the joy of your spouse. And since I have been mediating in a lot of marriages, I have found marriages where it is quite clear that one of the parties derives joy from the suffering of the other. 
and suffer the joy of the other, for instance, when the other makes career. And that career, the applause, doesn't come to the spouse. Okay, one can work on that. And then find a formula, a good one. Now, how do you arrive at that? Well, you start by empathy. And then that empathy goes one step further to this kind of emotional resonance I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that uh, resonance and harmony. Uh, for, <coughs> me. For, uh, for, for me, the uh, that's what empathy is. I mean, a component is creating that that uh, mirroring, that harmony, uh, that resonance where I'm actually able to feel your feelings within me. And it's almost you become like a third uh, shared common humanity. Okay, but don't you think that there is a first stage which is more cognitive knowledge? You know what the other stands for. And the second stage is when his ups and downs become part of your ups and downs. Well, we're, we're kind of getting into the definition of empathy, and there's a, a lot of, conf not confusion, but people use the word empathy in a lot of different ways. Um, okay. So I just give you You see, I'm so happy when at least as a very minimum you can understand what the other guy stands for. And it's not a question of agreeing or disagreeing, but you understand it so well that it becomes a part of yourself. Now, if in addition you start resonating with it, so much the better. Because then you will search for mutual joy and you will try to avoid mutual suffering. Yeah, so you're seeing it as the first part is kind of the understanding, kind of more of a perspective taking, able to take the person's perspective. And more, then, intellectual, more intellectual. More intellectual. And is that. Second, emotional. Uh, yeah, and is that the perspective intellectual uh, connection happens that it creates the opportunity for more of an emotional, deeper kind of resonance gets kind of built then? Okay. And then at that point in your marriage uh, situation, uh, it, story, it's that if you have a joy, I'm feeling your joy and I'm celebrating your joy instead of, you know, maybe feeling left out or something because we're kind of both feeling, you know, we're kind of both attuned like that. Imagine that you have husband and wife having a good, let us say, good French meal together. It's so important that they express the delight in their facial expressions, thereby communicate. And that comes to the spouse, and the spouse will respond by a similar expression. And you get a double joy. You're not only enjoying your food, you're enjoying her, enjoying her food too. If you then go from food to sex, it's quite obvious what I'm talking about. Well, my, my mother used to always say, you know, she was always talking about, oh, you got to get married and have a partner. She used to always say, uh, joys shared or joys doubled, sorrows shares or sorrows halved. So that's like that's an what, old... That's a wife's mother. <laughs> so, and, and now I kind of joke about that as the scientists are kind of catching up, you know, to these these uh, old sayings um, in terms of, you know, mirror neurons and all the science kind of behind it. Well, you know, I like jumping from the most international global down to the interpersonal because my experience is it's practically speaking the same. <coughs> it's 90% or 99% similar and there are some small differences. And I can mention one difference. I can do something useful in a marriage during one afternoon, uh, but to do something between two countries and two regions, Madly speaking, takes a little bit more time. So it's the same dynamic. I mean, a personal one-on-one on one, one on one relationship is kind of this is just a scaled-up version <laughs> of a uh, of the countries. It's the same underlying emotional, intellectual dynamics that are happening. Precisely. Yeah. Of course, with increasingly complex systems, there are lots of things that have to reverberate and have to distribute and have to move through the system and that takes time. 
Well, you know, you were talking and uh, saying, well, about how you get to the empathy. It seems like you can come from different, for me at least, that there's different routes to it. There's, uh, I mean, the, the definition that I'm using of empathy is kind of like a four parts to it. Uh, the first part is what I would call self-empathy. So that's sensory awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves. Uh, and then as we kind of have more space, we're able to uh, through uh, do a mirrored empathy, which is through mirror neurons. You know, where we're I think that's kind of the resonance that you're talking about. And that's then very, that's exactly it. And then the See, third, okay. or if I make if I can just go through these real quick, is kind of a framework. And then the third part is a uh, is uh, imagined empathy, which is the kind of that intellectual perspective taking that we can actually. Uh, you know, with self-awareness, as we become self-aware, we can actually realize that another person is a separate uh, entity and that they have a different experience and we can see the world from kind of their perspective and has maybe more of that cognitive, you know, called perspective taking cognitive empathy. And then the fourth part is empathic action, that as we have that sense of resonance, the, the more we can kind of come to that resonance, that then the uh, we kind of like naturally want to contribute to each other's well-being, and that's where I, maybe the creativity in that uh, in that quote that you have comes in. That that we can start working together to you know go forward in in how we're going to relate in life. Well, yeah, but for the creativity, you have to create something, you see, and usually something new. You see, Edwin, last week I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. I was in a sideshow to the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. And the sideshow was about, uh, well, it was actually about what would a peaceful United States foreign policy look like. So I took as an example the Americas, and I took as an example how you have 35 states altogether in the Americas. Now, Two of them are in the north, Canada and the United States. Mexico is also in the north. And then you have quite a lot, 33 to be exact, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Right now, the only country siding with the United States and Canada is Trinidad Tobago. So what is happening? Well, what is happening, as I try to point out, is very similar to what the Atlantic seaboard colonies did in 1776 to London. They simply said a lot of things, but essentially what they did was in 1776 to declare independence. And the Latin American Caribbean states have declared that now. So what then is wise U.S. policy? So I would, of course, say to realize that it is very similar to 1776 and to say, we welcome you. We understand what you are doing. We are looking into our own history. We understand it. There are things we don't like, but anyhow, this is the way it happens. But could we keep the organization of American states as a dialogue for them? There is so much to talk about. You have your own institutions, we have ours, the North American Free Trade Area, NAFTA, which is more or less North American, expanding down to. And let us then try to cooperate as much as possible. And maybe Washington could say one more thing. George III didn't like what we did in 76. And the War of Independence went on to 1810 12. Now, that was a hell of a lot of time. We don't have to do the same. Can't we just simply sit down together and find ways of cooperating? So there you would fetch the empathy from your own history, in a sense. Haven't I experienced something like this? It's not a bad source. But it means that you have to change U.S. policies today quite a lot. Now, what the U.S. seems to be doing is to, um, it's on one-upmanship on George III, uh, who got his certificates written by Thomas Jefferson, uh, very in the preamble, 
It's not a nice certificate at all. And those certificates are now being written in Latin America all over the place about Bush Obama or whatever is the name of the president. It's not good. So I just indicated something using yourself as a source for empathy. Well, you have uh, your your book um, is the fall of the U.S. Empire and then what? And I, it kind of relates, I think, somewhat to this. And for me, the Very then so. the, the uh, then what is? I mean, that's what I want to do is to build a culture of empathy. Is that we need to take empathy and replace? I mean, and bring it to the forefront of social values and say that you know America is a culture of empathy and that we want to uh, foster that empathy, uh, you know, throughout, you know, throughout, you know, society. And how do we go about doing that? I guess that's kind of where I am at is that how do we, you know, looking I'm, in these dialogues, I'm asking, you know, for, to create a dialogue about that, about that vision. Well, Edwin, this is where I think you need the concept of equity in addition to empathy. You know, empathy is something inside you. It's an attitudinal disposition and terribly important. But equity is structural. It's the relation you build. And the question is, how can you go from an empire, which is global domination, not only politically, but also economically, politically, <laughs> militarily, and cultural? The idea that one country happens to be exceptional and closer to God than other countries and for that reason commands respect as God's messenger on earth. Now, there are many countries believed in that. Today, very, very few, the U.S. is concerned. And maybe that countries are created equal is something that Jefferson didn't write, but he could have written it, um, being a good script, using a good script. Uh, maybe that would be a better idea. And here, the question of creativity comes in. How do you do that? How do you do equity? Well, you look at your economic relations. Are they for mutual and relatively equal benefit? Or is somebody benefiting much more than the other? There's a lot to say about Chinese-US, for instance, relations. A lot to say about that. So let me indicate one thing immediately. China is the creditor. As Hillary Clinton points out, it's not so easy to have your creditor as a dialogue partner. But on the other hand, U.S. is encircling China. U.S. has bases very close to China. China does not have bases close to the U.S. Maybe China will do well to forgive much of that debt if U.S. could withdraw that encircling. Just to mention an example. Now, for that, you need a dialogue, you need an open dialogue. Maybe you need a public conference. Maybe also a conference about how to lift the bottom up in Chinese society. Three to four hundred million during a period of 14 years. From 1991, according to the World Bank, whereas in the U.S. people at the bottom are sinking further down. 16% or 15.3% being below the poverty line, 17.5% in North Carolina, where DNC was meeting, not wasting one word on that problem. So having said that, what could China learn in return? Creativity, diversity. There is very much creative diversity in US society. You don't sense it so much in foreign policy, but you sense it domestically. A society with an enormous amount of creative niches which is why my Japanese wife and I, the country number one where we are living, since we can live in many places during the year, is the United States of America. I love it as much as I hate the empire, Edward. Mm -hmm. That empire is now going down the hill, sliding down very quickly. It well, should be pointed out that that unfortunately doesn't rule out violence. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. now has to do the violence itself. It cannot have local elites to do it for them. But the, oh, so they don't, don't. have drones and seals now operating, you know, even without the government of the country knowing it. 
That's not imperialism. I call it geofascism. Mm -hmm. It will not serve the United States well. So when you were first starting, I was hearing, what was the word equanimity or e the... Equity is structural. Equity is, oh, is structural. Okay. So we have, we have, so is that addressing like social structures? Like, for example, we have the justice system, uh, which is kind of like a gladiatorial, gladiatorial sport in a sense, right? We got two lawyers who are kind of like the gladiators for you. They're going to battle it out. And whoever wins um, kind of has the, you know, somehow the, that's called justice versus yeah, here really. You a good, here you are a good American admin. You cannot imagine an example without somehow having fighting in it. What yeah. you're thinking of now is that it's according to the rules, equal chances, equal playing fields and things of that kind. How oh, about thinking of cooperation? Cooperation in a family where challenging tasks come equally to husband and wife. And the not so challenging but boring tasks come equally. Well, I, well, I hadn't quite finished. Um, what I was saying is that for me, that's not a culture of empathy. That's like a culture of competition. And a culture of empathy is more like restorative justice where uh, you know people are, are, are kind of dialoguing with each other and coming to an empathic connection. And so that's a structure, right? The social, the court system is a social structure that is not necessarily fostering empathy and connection between people. So I was just wondering if that's what you're addressing is the social structures like that. The institutions are structured, uh, you know, in a competitive, non-empathic way very much. And you can have one without the other. But it's much better if empathy and equity come together. Uh huh. Yeah. So structurally, have a structure that is geared towards fostering connection between people. Precisely, uh -huh. and it fosters empathic connection, and the empathic connection fosters equity. Mm -hmm. That would be the ideal thing. Now, between the among the Nordic countries, you have much of that. The ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia, much of that. They're very sensitive to what happens to the other country when they set up an economic deal, for instance. It's not only me, 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 my, 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 it's ours, ours, ours. So it's the fostering of we feelings. And you can say that the resonance, the harmony I was talking about, is a kind of element of fusion of the parties. They feel so close together that the hurt that comes to one is a hurt to me at the same time and the same with the joy. Now, this to me is positive peace, of course. Uh, there is also the concept of negative peace, which is to avoid direct and structural violence. That would be a ceasefire, for instance, with no relations. The countries agree to have very little to do with each other. But that's not positive peace. That's on the absence of violence. Uh, that's just it's avoidance. An and uh -huh. you can build on it, yeah. but there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you'd, you'd had, I saw on your website, you kind of had broken it down to, you know, there's the, the, the way the justice system is, is one side wins, the other loses. And it's, there's like a sense, you know, there's like dissatisfaction within that. And then you can also avoid the conflict, is what you're talking about. Or you can actually engage be present with the conflict and and work through it and try to come to that that deeper connection. That's, that's, it. that's mm. exactly. It. You see, we use the word transcend to honor the word creativity. It means to go beyond actually what the parties stand for and find something better than that. Now, the little example I had with Latin America and North America would be Mexuscan, a North American region consisting of Mexico, United States, and Canada. It would be a beautiful region, and now more than one million U.S. citizens live in Mexico, partly retired people, because the pension funds are stretched further in Mexico than back home. Now, so there's quite a lot of move in the opposite direction, not only Mexicans searching for the American dream, and right now having some difficulties finding it, to put it mildly. 
Now, Mexico could then have a bridging road. And we are approaching the 21st of September, Peace Day. But I'll be in Mexico City giving a talk about the exact. So, so you're Mexico wanting to create your own. That kind right. of bridge concept. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're wanting to create uh, creative uh, options. I mean, that you're bringing forth. Like, here's a creative option to try this. Uh, here's another creative option. How about this? So it's really that it sounds looks like you're wanting to offer kind of this creative creative uh create offer your creativity that's exactly it i could give an example of it i think it was in 1991 i was asked by the kurds what would be a creative option and i said three stages human rights for kurds in the four countries iraq iran turkey syria some autonomous region with, practically speaking, Kurdish self-rule, and then a confederation of these autonomies, because they uh, come together in the area where those four countries meet. They come together. Well, that was 1991. Today, the goal of the Turkish Kurds is no longer an independent part of Turkey, but a confederation of autonomies. I have a feeling that I know where it came from. They don't have to quote me, you see, because this is not a professorial academic game of being quoted. It's a question of floating an idea. Mm -hmm. and those who picked it up may not have the slightest idea where it came from. But when I look at some of the uh, sentences, I have a feeling I know the syntax. Now, of course, that does good to me. I like it, because that means I have been used for it. I've been floating an idea that might serve a purpose because you can have that confederation without moving a single border, not one millimeter. The moment you try to move a border, you are in deep problems. There are some organizations called armies that uh, are very sensitive to borders, to put it mildly. So you see, that's where the creativity comes in. You try to bridge across the borders and you can even imagine, as I said, the passport, which has Turkey and under that Kurdistan. Syria and under that Kurdistan. Now, that's typographical. It costs no money. You could imagine the costs of trying to move the board. So uh, this kind of brings me to kind of a question I, I tend to ask in, in these dialogues is, what is your most important value to you personally? Like of all the different values, is there one that really, you know, stands out for you that's most important to you at, at a personal level? Being useful. <laughs> <laughs> and the being useful presupposes also that you are useful. Now, I was asked the other day, how old are you? And I said, I'm 120 over 80. Just my blood pressure. <laughs> blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an 18 years old boy, and I could say you are as old as your blood pressure. Now, I have a feeling of being useful, you see, and that makes me youthful. Keeps me happy, keeps me alive, keeps me young, keeps me fresh. Oh, you, of course, understand what I mean by being useful. It is less violence, more peace. Mm -hmm. For me, that would be contributing to the well-being of others. I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. I use the Buddhist term sukha and dukkha. Dukkha is suffering, sukha is well-being. And I could say to reduce suffering and increase well-being. In the book, A Theory of Peace, which is just around the corner, that's the form they use. And how did that value become important to you? Is there, again, some story or anecdote of how that became important to you in your life? I think it was through my father, who was a physician, whose father was a physician, whose father was a physician. And uh, he told me so often, decrease suffering and increase a sense of well-being. And he also told me his despair. People are happy to get rid of the suffering, but they were unable to enjoy well-being. So he had a concept, which I like, 
negative pleasures. <laughs> the pleasure of the suffering you don't have. That you, so to speak, enjoy consciously the thing that you take for granted. For instance, the feeling, oh, that I can get up in the morning, curling my toes, breathing, just enjoying life. Well, breathe a little bit deeply, curl your toes even more, and enjoy it further. So, you see, that kind of thing seems to me very, very important. Would that be gratitude? Learn it. Is that gratitude, would you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think gratitude. Religious people will say to God, I could say just gratitude. Just plain gratitude. I sense it. Well, uh, I feel very grateful that you took the time to share this hour with me and, uh, and talk about empathy and, you know, the, your values and, you know, how, you know, how we can foster empathy. So I could talk for hours, but I just had mentioned an hour. Perhaps we can talk some more, or, you know, keep the dialogue going, maybe do some panels in the future around this because, uh, I've been holding panels via Skype <clears throat> as well around how do we foster empathy. I think that's terribly important. And you add to that the equity and the higher level of empathy that I call harmony. And don't forget the traumas from the past. Mm -hmm. Go back and work through those traumas, uh, reconnect to those traumas that, uh, so that they don't remain buried and bring them up and empathize with them. Perhaps. We have in Transcend a lot of methods to do that. 12 methods to be quite concrete. And that takes a little bit of time. But I can share with you one point. If I have parties like Serbs and Albanians in one room, and I talk about those 12 methods and they start discussing, the very fact of discussing, having a dialogue about how to overcome trauma, is itself a way of overcoming trauma. Mm. There's something spiritual in it. People start thinking thoughts they had never thought of before. And it goes much beyond saying, I'm sorry, and can you forgive me? That's one approach out of 20. A little bit too burdened. Well, we can uh, maybe line up another interview and we'll go through those uh, steps and how they relate to empathy uh, at some time. So. Uh, I can keep going for hours, you know, talking about this, but I probably should bring it to a close. So um, thank you, uh, Johan uh, Galtung, so much for taking the time. And I'm really grateful for, you know, for you sharing kind of your warm hearted uh, uh, presence. Thank you so much indeed. My pleasure. Okay. Bye, Johan. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.